say that you come to my office hours and you've gotten some advice from another faculty member and you don't know whether this is good advice. And I say to you something like this. Here's what I say. You can trust me on this one. I've been around college professors for a long time. Don't listen to a word they say. They can't be trusted. What's wrong with this? What's the problem with this? Problem is, I'm a college professor saying this about college professors. So if I'm right, if what I say here is true, then I can't be trusted, right? If you can trust me, if you can trust what I say, well, here's something that I say. If you can trust what I say, then you can trust this, and that you can trust that college professors can't be trusted. So if you can trust what I say, you can't trust what I say. Because I'm a college professor too. This bit of advice is self-defeating or self-refuting. It defeats itself. It scores a goal on its own goal, like in soccer. If you kick the ball into your own team's goal, you've scored a goal against yourself. This sort of advice scores a goal against itself. It goes into battle, to use another metaphor, and stabs itself and kills itself. It's self-defeating or self-refuting. If you can trust this statement, if it's true, assume that it's true. That's what statements want. Claims want to be true, right? So assume that it's true. If it's true, then it's false. If you can trust it, then you can't trust it because it says inside itself that you can't trust it. It's self-defeating in a certain kind of way. The question for today is whether moral skepticism is also self-defeating. Actually, that's not the question for today, because moral skepticism is definitely not self-defeating. Moral skepticism doesn't defeat itself, but there's a certain argument for moral skepticism that does defeat itself. That's why there's a chapter in this book, the chapter that we're on right now, right, is chapter 11 of the Schaefer Landau book, right? If you haven't read the book, go read it. This book is an attack on moral skepticism. It's trying to show that moral skepticism is false. One nice way for it to be false would be if it was self-refuting. Philosophers love when some view that they're arguing against is self-refuting, because that's not just beating them, that's showing that they've beat themselves. That's the best. So it would be nice for Schaefer Landau if moral skepticism were self-refuting, but it's not. However, this chapter in this book exists because there's a certain argument for moral skepticism that is self-refuting. Here is the argument. Okay, that's the argument. Global skepticism is true. Global skepticism entails moral skepticism. Therefore, moral skepticism is true. Okay, that's the argument. Let's go over a whole bunch of stuff in this argument. First thing we want to know is uh, what is global skepticism? We also might want to know what the word entails means. That would help, okay? What's going to happen, though, is this. Before we get into these things, I want to make this point. We're going to get an argument against this argument. That is, Schaefer Landau is going to try to show in this chapter that this argument doesn't work, that this is no good. But that doesn't show that moral skepticism is false or that this conclusion is false and that therefore moral skepticism is false. The conclusion could still be true, even if this one argument or one way of getting to that conclusion doesn't work, because there could be some other argument or some other way to get to this conclusion. So we're not going to get an attack on the truth of moral skepticism. We're going to get an attack on global skepticism and thereby an attack on this route to moral skepticism, this argument for moral skepticism. If you're not 100% comfortable with the distinction between a conclusion and the argument in favor of that conclusion, if you're not 100% comfortable with that difference, then 
go watch my other video that I made for this course about attacking arguments and attacking conclusions for arguments. And maybe there'll be a link somewhere. I don't know, I don't know where the link will be uh, or something like that. But you need, Google it if you have to, Google my name and then arguments versus conclusions or attacks on arguments. I don't know what the video is called or going to be called, but find it. Okay, regardless, what we're doing today is we're getting an argument against this argument, which is not necessarily an argument against the conclusion. Okay, so while I erase this half of the board, let's talk about the notion of entailment, what it is for something to entail something else. It just means this. It means that the, if the first thing is true, then the second thing has to be true or is guaranteed to be true. Here's an example. Take the claim that grass is green. Okay, that entails that grass is visible. I'll do it in green, right? Because how does color work? Well, uh, I don't know, light, there's, all the, there's white light, and it comes from the sun, and it hits the grass, and then the grass says, Oh, uh, the purple light and the red light that make up this light. I want that light. Give me the purple. Give me the red. I'll absorb that. And then the green part of the spectrum, or the yellow and the blue parts of the spectrum, I don't really know. It says, forget these. And it, it doesn't absorb that light. That light reflects off the grass. And then it goes into your eyeball, and then something happens with cones and rods. I don't really understand that part. And then you experience the grass as being green. It looks green. It looks green because light bounces off of it. And that's just what it is for something to be visible, is for light to bounce off it, right? So if you know that grass is green, then you know for sure that it reflects light. And that if it reflects light in that way, then it's visible. It's the kind of thing that can be seen. So the truth of this guarantees the truth of this. And that would be the case even if grass was a different color, right? Even if grass wasn't green, but instead was pink. Or rather, forget that, say that grass really is green. It's still the case that the claim that grass is pink entails the claim that grass is visible. This is false. But if it were true that grass was pink, then we'd be guaranteed that grass is visible because pink is a color. And if something has a color, then light bounces off of it, and that light can go in your eye. And then you would see it, and that's what it is for something to be visible. So the claim that grass is pink, false as it is, entails or guarantees the truth of this claim. If this is true, then this is guaranteed to be true. That's what it is for one claim to entail another claim. Global skepticism entails moral skepticism. That means that if global skepticism is true, then moral skepticism has to be true. Is that right? Uh, well, to figure that out, we need to know what global skepticism is. You remember, of course, what moral skepticism is. Moral skepticism is just the view that there are no objective moral truths. Global skepticism is the view that there are no objective truths at all about anything. There are no objective truths at all about anything. That's global skepticism. Some version of skepticism is plausible for some domains of claims, right? Take the claim that pickles, is that how you spell pickles? I don't know. Pickles are tasty. That's a claim about whether or not something is tasty. Skepticism about the existence of objective truths in the tasty domain is plausible. At least it is to me. It seems to me that there's no universal fact about whether or not pickles are tasty. There's sort of individual facts for each person, for each person, or maybe even for each person at a time in their life. There's a fact about whether pickles are tasty for them. Or not. But there's no universal objective truths about whether anything is tasty. Tastiness, as they say, is in the eye of the beholder or in the mouth. 
of the beholder. So some kind of skepticism about objective truths is plausible for tastiness claims. And we've seen earlier in this course that some kind of skepticism about objective truths in the moral domain is very attractive to lots of folks, and there are some arguments for it that are not crazy. We read a certain passage from Hume that seemed to advocate for a certain kind of moral skepticism, and we've also read some other things that advocated for versions of moral skepticism, where it's not about pickles and tastiness, it's about whether certain things are evil or good or right or wrong. Global skepticism is the view that this is true of every type of claim. There are no objective truths of any kind, not about whether pickles are tasty or not, not about whether pie is tasty or not, not about whether certain actions are right or wrong, not about the sizes and movement of planets, not about the shapes of the mountains, not about anything. There are no facts that are universally true for everyone everywhere. That's global skepticism. Okay. Once we know what the view is, we can see that the second premise of this argument is very plausible. It's true, in fact, right? Global skepticism is just the view that there are no objective truths about anything. Well, and if there are no objective truths about anything, then there are no objective truths about morality. And that's just what moral, moral skepticism says. So global skepticism does guarantee the truth of moral skepticism, if it's true in the first place, right? That's like if uh, you say to someone, there's no ice cream in the fridge, or the freezer, sorry, ice cream's in the freezer. There's no ice cream in the freezer, and they say, Yes, but is there strawberry ice cream in the freezer? And you say, no, there can't be any strawberry ice cream because there's no ice cream at all. And strawberry ice cream is just a kind of ice cream. Are there objective moral truths? Well, if we already know that there are no objective truths at all, then there can't be objective moral truths because those are just some type of objective truths. That's it. So this premise is good. And the argument is valid. So if anything is wrong with this argument, it's got to be premise one. And that's what Schaefer Landau attacks. He attacks this premise, shows that it's false, and thereby undermines this argument. And again, that doesn't show that the conclusion is false. It just shows that this way of getting to the conclusion uh, won't work. OK, so what's the argument that this conclusion is false? Well. There's actually a lot of reason to think that global skepticism is implausible on the face of it. Um, the main argument for global skepticism comes from the idea that, well, different people have different perspectives. And that some perspectives aren't better than other perspectives, and that therefore some beliefs that result from the perspectives aren't better than other beliefs, and that if the beliefs aren't going to be, well, some better than others, then it has to be the case that there are no facts, objective facts, backing up those beliefs, making some of them better than other beliefs. It's a sort of argument like that. I talk about that argument in another video, which maybe will be linked here or maybe won't, and you should search for it. I don't know. That's an argument against an argument for global skepticism. But actually, we don't need to undermine this argument for global skepticism, because global skepticism defeats itself. That's the claim of this chapter. Global skepticism is self-defeating. Now we have to see how it's self-defeating. To see that global skepticism is self-refuting, we just need to look at the main varieties of global skepticism, and there's three. And you'll notice they correspond to the main varieties of moral skepticism. First, there is global nihilism. Global nihilism is the view that, well, there are no truths at all. Notice, though, this is not the same as this. Global skepticism says that there are no objective truths. There are no universal truths that are true for everyone everywhere. There might, on that view, still be some non-objective truths. Global nihilism says, no, there's not any of those either. So this is the claim that there are no truths at all. 
that's different from the claim, well, that we could call global subjectivism. That's the view that there are no objective truths at all, but that there are some subjective truths, truths that are true relative to individual people. And then, of course, there's the view that, well, there are no objective truths, but that the truths that there are, they are relative to societies or cultures. There are different truths for different groups of people. And that we might call global relativism. Notice, first of all, that, say, for example, global relativism, that's not the claim that there are some truths that are relative to different societies. Everyone accepts that there are some truths, well, everyone except for the nihilist, accepts that there are some truths that are true relative to certain societies. Is it true that, uh, you know, it's rude to chew with your mouth open? Well, whether or not that's true depends on what society you're in. In some societies, it's rude to chew with your mouth open. In other societies, it's not. It's actually polite to chew with your mouth open, right? So relativism of that kind is very plausible in some cases when it comes to statements about rudeness or politeness. Global relativism is the claim that every truth is relative in that way. There are no truths that are not relative to different societies or different cultures. That's global relativism. And global subjectivism says there are no truths that are not relative to individual people. And nihilism just says that there are no truths of any kind, objective, non-objective, uh, relative, non-relative. There are no truths of any kind at all. That's global nihilism. Let's go through each of these and see how each of them are, in a certain way, self-refuting. Let's start with global nihilism, because this is the easiest. Global nihilism says that there are no truths of any kind. Well, the claim of global nihilism is itself a purported truth. But if there are no truths, then global nihilism is not true. So, global nihilism is not true. According to global nihilism, if global nihilism is true, then global nihilism is not true. Because global nihilism says that nothing is true. So, of course, it's also not true either. So global nihilism defeats itself. It's self-defeating. If you assume that it's true, it proves itself to be false. That's it. Done. Global nihilism is done. Okay, we got through the first one. Now, let's turn to global subjectivism. So global subjectivism is the claim that all truths are relative to individual people. Or, at least one way of making out this view is the view that everyone's beliefs are true. If someone believes it, then it's true. Well, here's something that someone believes. In particular, here's something that the author of the book that we read the chapter of today believes. He believes that global subjectivism is false. That's something he believes. That's one of his beliefs. He also believes that the Earth is 93 million miles from the sun, or that George Washington was the first president of the United States, or whatever. But this one, this is one of his beliefs too. Well, if global subjectivism is true, then this belief of his is true also. Well, if this belief of his is true, then global subjectivism is false. So if global subjectivism is true, then, because one person at least believes that global subjectivism is false, then global subjectivism is false. Self-refuting. Notice something. This argument, the argument that global subjectivism is self-refuting, it was not as fast as the argument that global nihilism was self-refuting. That argument was very quick, whereas in this case, we needed an extra premise or an extra fact. That fact is that at least one person believes that global subjectivism is false. Now that's very plausible. It's very plausible that there's at least one person that believes this. And if there is, then 
according to global subjectivism, global subjectivism is false. So that's a certain kind of self-refutation. Okay, now let's turn to global relativism, the view that all truths are relative to societies or cultures. Or, at least one way of making out this view is the view on which whatever some society believes, really whatever enough of its members believe, is true for that society, or something like that. Well, here's the thing. No society believes in global relativism, right? Uh, think about whatever society you live in. Do the vast majority of people think that the Earth is round, right? Or that grass is green? Yeah, they do. They think that. And they think that these things are just true for everyone everywhere, and that people who don't know these facts are confused for some reason or another. Right? They have trouble perceiving the color of things, or they've bought into certain fallacious, mistaken, misguided arguments that the Earth is flat. If the societies in which people live think something like global relativism is false, if they all think that, and it seems like every one of them seems to hold this at least implicitly, then according to global relativism, this claim is true. Because global relativism just says that, well, if a society believes something, then that thing, whatever they believe, is true, for them at least. So it's going to be true, at least for many societies, that global relativism is false. So, at least for every society that exists, if global relativism is true, then global relativism is false. Self-refuting. And then the thought is, well look, these were the main ways to be a global skeptic, to think that there are no objective truths, and all of them defeated themselves. So, in the relevant, interesting sense, global skepticism is self-defeating. And if that's right, well, then this claim is not true. Not only is global skepticism not true, it shows of itself that it's false. That's about as big of a problem as you can get for an argument like this. And then we're going to need to find some other way to show that the conclusion is still false. That we're going to get in the next couple of chapters. Wait, I have one more thing I have to say. Uh, and obviously, I got a haircut and changed my clothes, but we're still talking about whether global skepticism is self-refuting and whether moral skepticism is self-refuting. Okay, so what we just went through was an argument that global skepticism is self-refuting. And the way that argument worked was that it went through three different uh, sub-varieties of global skepticism. Okay, so we went through each of these and showed that each of these views were self-refuting. The question is, can we run this same kind of argument for moral skepticism? Could we go through each of these, moral nihilism, moral subjectivism, moral relativism, and show that they are self-refuting in the same way that we showed that global nihilism, global subjectivism, and global relativism were self-refuting? The answer is no, we can't. There was something about these theories that opened them up to self-refutation that doesn't open up these theories to self-refutation. And that thing is this. These theories are all global. They're all about all sorts of claims, right? So, we, you know, there are claims about, um, well, the cosmos, right? That Earth is 93 million miles from the sun. That's a claim about the Earth. Well, global views like nihilism and subjectivism and relativism, they're about all kinds of statements, all kinds of truths, all kinds of claims. So they apply to this, right? And they apply also to claims about themselves 
and claims about whether or not these theories themselves are true. So global nihilism, right, is also a theory about the claim that global nihilism is true. And it's because global nihilism renders a verdict on this claim. It says that it's not true, right? Because global nihilism renders a claim on that verdict, that it gets itself into this self-refutation problem. The point is this, is that in order to get self-refutation in the way that we got it here, right, you need a kind of self-reference. These theories are about claims about themselves in a way. They're about claims of their own truth. They render a verdict on these claims and they say, oh, in the case of the nihilist, there are no truths of this kind. But in the moral case, we don't have that. Moral nihilism just doesn't tell us, for example, anything about the claim moral nihilism is true. And that's because this claim, moral nihilism is true, is not itself a moral claim. It doesn't say that some action or some belief is good or evil or right or wrong. It just says, this claim just says that a certain theory, a certain philosophical theory, is true. Moral nihilism doesn't tell us whether there is such a truth like this or not. And moral subjectivism doesn't say that this kind of claim uh, is only true relative to individual people, right? And moral relativism doesn't say that this kind of truth is only true relative to societies or cultures or anything like that, because these theories aren't about claims like that. They're only about moral claims. Because they don't give us the result that this, that this claim is, well, false or only relatively true, we can't run the same kind of a uh, self-referential, self-refuting argument that we were able to run in this case. So these guys escape the problem, although, as we just saw, if there's an argument that goes from global skepticism to moral skepticism, then the failure of global skepticism, right, undermines that argument. Moral skepticism may still be true, but this argument for it won't show it to be true.